Hello and welcome back to another show of this week. This week we have decided to bring you a special program highlighting the visit to South Sudan of the United Nations Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, Adama Dieng, who was in the country for five days. While in the country, the Under Secretary General also met with several government officials, members of the United Nations, stakeholders to South Sudan's peace agreement, and those affected by South Sudan's conflict. In our first story, we shed light on a visit by Adama Dieng to a protection of civilian site in Juba. In mid-December 2013, the United Nations opened its doors to protect civilians who flee to its gates. Since then, though the responsibility for protection of civilians remains that of the government, the mission's gates have remained open to hundreds of thousands of displaced people fleeing from danger. To date, protection of civilian sites dot six UN compounds with close to 210,000 displaced seeking safety. During his visit to the country, Adama Dieng visited one protection of civilian site and met with some of those who lived there. In an interview after a meeting which was closed to cameras, the race of violence to incite is unacceptable. Unfortunately, in July 2016, I was shocked by killings of civilians who had committed no wrongs. And I was more concerned with the fact that there seemed to be killings which were targeted specifically against ethnic groups. And I issued a statement. And from that time until now, there has been a rise of, uh, I would say, incitement to violence, which has to come to an end. It is simply unacceptable that we see in a country which is the youngest nation of this world, to see a country where you have near two million people who are displaced, that we cannot make peace being sustained. He said he hoped that all actors to the conflict would get together. It is my sincere hope that uh, the tension which is prevailing in the country will be diffused and that uh, all the actors will get together and really start strengthening the nation building in South Sudan. And that is possible and it is my sincere desire that when I report back to the Security Council, the international community will spare no efforts so as to ensure that the protection of the civilian in South Sudan will be strengthened. We are talking about deploying uh, further troops. He said South Sudanese were responsible for their own country in as much as the international community was working hard to ensure peace. At the end of the day, the situation in South Sudan depends also of the will of the South Sudanese themselves. Nobody will save South Sudan but the South Sudanese themselves. We can only, during a time, provide them with the necessary support, provide them with protection, with facilities, but they have to come together and to build this country. Dieng said the international community would not look back on South Sudan and stressed out on the need for genuine will. My fear today is that in light of the recent development, if efforts are not made, others also may start creating their own armies and starting again a war. And this is something the international community should not allow to happen. And therefore, efforts have to be made urgently to provide protection to the South Sudanese and also to provide forum for the peace to be sustained in this country. He said those sheltered in POCs should be able to return to their land and start a new life, a new life of peace. 
Coming up in our next story, we take you back to Adama Dieng's first visit to South Sudan in 2014, where he traveled to the country with the then High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay. Here is the story. Just over two years ago, at the end of April 2014, a few months after South Sudan's December 2013 conflict, UN's top human rights official, Navy Pillay, accompanied by Adama Dieng, the special advisor on prevention of genocide, arrived in Juba to discuss the country's worsening human rights situation in the wake of killings in South Sudan's Unity and Jongola state capitals. Their visit was at the request of the Secretary General of United Nations, who expressed concern over the situation in South Sudan. We from the outside think the situation is very grave and that there might be revenge killings. You know, when there's a dispute between two leaders, as we say in Africa, when two elephants fight, it's a grass that suffers. Well, here I see civilians, ordinary people, uh, who are suffering, and they are suffering huge human rights violations from right to food, to violence, sexual violence, and so on. These are my concern. The Pile and Dieng delegation was in South Sudan for three days to travel to sites where human rights violations had occurred, so as to assess the human rights situation and talk to victims, senior government officials, and those in the opposition. They met with senior government officials then, and their trip also took them to an undisclosed location where they met with the SPLM in opposition to discuss the worsening human rights situation in the wake of killings in the country. During this trip, Dieng said that opening UNMIS gates to civilians seeking protection was a first in history and a vital decision taken to make sure that what happened in Rwanda 20 years ago would not happen in South Sudan. Speaking to journalists at the time, they expressed grave concern of the situation in the country then where a mix of recrimination, hate speech and killing seems to be reaching boiling point. The deadly mix of uh, recrimination, hate speech and revenge killings that has developed relentlessly over the past four and a half months seems to be reaching boiling point. And I have been increasingly concerned that neither South Sudan's political leaders nor the international community at large seem to perceive quite how dangerous the situation now is. Unfortunately, virtually everything I have seen or heard on this mission has reinforced the view that the country's leaders, instead of seizing their chance to steer their impoverished and war-battered young nation to stability and greater prosperity, have instead embarked on a personal power struggle that has brought their people to the verge of catastrophe. There can be no peace without justice, and a current culture of impunity will only serve to undermine our efforts. We have learned this the hard way from events in Rwanda. Uh, to the survivors of the genocide, we owe a pledge to take all possible measures within our power uh, to protect population from another Rwanda. There is no excuse for inaction. Since their April 2014 visit, a peace deal was signed in August 2015 by the main force and a return to conflict in July 2016 escalated concerns for urgent peace. Welcome back. In our next story, Adama Dieng makes a day trip to South Sudan's border town of Ye, where recent unrest there has changed the face of this once bustling town. A few days before the arrival of the UN Special Advisor of the Secretary General, an integrated mission from the United Nations mission in South Sudan, comprising of civilians from different sections, including the military, traveled by the road to the border town which lies to the south of the country's capital of Juba. The aim of the trip was to assess the situation in the town following recent reports of conflict in the area.
The objective of the mission was to show UNIS presence and to also under maintain situational awareness on the ground. While on the patrol, teams spoke to state officials, community and religious leaders and interviewed residents as they sought to find out the needs and effects of conflict on the community. So there are quite a number of challenges. People have run away from their farms, they don't have food, and there are a lot of issues of security because the armed groups are still in the bushes, not too far away from uh, here. That we achieved the aim of the uh, mission because we are able to see what is on ground, we are able to also interact with people and get relevant information. Of particular concern was on the way to here we discovered a lot of communities and villages have been abandoned. People have run away from those places because of fear and we brought this to the attention of also the uh, stakeholders and the governments too. And they confirmed that yes, up till now people are still moving out of various communities because they were already afraid that there might still be serious fighting in, 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 in EA, especially as the, uh, the armed groups are trying to close in, closer and closer to EA. So we hope that the situation will continue to improve with the effort being made by the bishops and the government to engage with the various groups and uh, uh, try to dialogue, especially also to avoid the issue of uh, hate speech, which is also causing a lot of scare to many people. A resident of Ganji, located between Juba and Ye, said he was on the run because of insecurity in his area and the environs. Okay, but I must tell you, you are a good rebel. If you are a rebel, you are a big guy in the Muskila. I have a big fogo. And what that is a big guy. Tabani had a big guy and Batal Kalas. Big Muskila could be a guy and what me. Young Martin could be a big guy in the cup. You know, Kalam de Kulu Gay, you know, Saka de Kulu Biga Gay, you know, what? Yana can give it in. Kambiga muskila de bigale muati na kare kelewo dinna fi juba asande be sibu belede inke na koma bag de geni foga san kelia arfo bidap adure jay min wen with the arrival of adama dieng to ye meeting with the community leaders local government and religious leaders highlighted ongoing tensions and a grave humanitarian concern in an interview while on the ground adama dieng said he was moved by those he listened to. I was extremely moved when from Ye I listened to a woman who was describing the condition under which they are living today. I should say that uh, Ye used to be one of the most peaceful area of South Sudan. And uh, I should say that we have to understand that there is nothing more precious than peace. And I call on all leaders uh, to understand that what is most important today is what unites them rather than what divides them. We have to make sure that this country doesn't fall into brink. He said, Ye merited immediate intervention. Reporting for this week, I am Regina Gorle. On his return from Ye to Juba, Adama Dieng made an appearance on Radio Mirai's live program called The Beat, where he had a chance to explain his complex work in a light-hearted way to secondary level students. Some students were able to connect from Malakal and they indeed asked some questions. Following up is a segment of what we edited highlighting the show. So today we're going to talk about which is the most horrendous crime. Sure. So, sir, mm, we have learned that. Okay, what is your job about? Like? My job was established in 2004 as a result of the failure of the international community to prevent genocide in Rwanda, to prevent genocide in Srebrenica. I'm very sure that people who are listening, maybe the others who are wondering what we are talking about, like, can you tell us what genocide is? Well, genocide is, as I said earlier, a horrendous crime 
we call it the crime of the crime. The word genocide was coined by a Polish lawyer named Raphael Lemkin. Genocide is the killing of members of a group because of their race, their nationality, their religion, or their ethnic. And uh, those are the four groups which are protected by what is known as the Genocide Convention, which was adopted the 9th December 1948. Okay, sir, uh, I learned that you have been here for a week now, and there have been many things taking place. So what do you see in this visit, and how does it look to you? I saw the fear among the population, and I said, well, something needs to be done because these are early signs and when you see those early signs you take preventive measure so that this doesn't happen what i want is simply as i was saying all south sudanese to be together to live peacefully no nowhere no dinka nobody no but simply south sudanese so can you tell us the preventive measures that all the people can take in order to prevent genocide and is it uh, everyone's responsibility to take that measure we all have a role to play by starting we have to respect each other i have to respect your culture i have to respect your way and now, it is the primary responsibility of the state to protect its population. And that was recognized by the world leaders in 2005 when they adopted an important document called R2P, Responsibility to Protect, which means that if the state failed to protect its population, including the refugee population, the international community will come and protect those people. Uh, since uh, South Sudan seceded, uh, it was for the good cause, or for a good cause. Uh, what do you think went wrong? The power struggle. It is important that uh, political leaders sacrifice their selfish interests for the good of the people. What went wrong was that instead of focusing really on cementing the working, living, the living together, because we should not forget that uh, before that independence was achieved, there were a lot of uh, killings also, a lot of between various groups. And then one should have cement the uh, re reconciliation among the people of South Sudan. And we failed. The South Sudanese leadership failed, but also the international community failed to support them in really putting emphasis on the need for the people of South Sudan to be reconciled. The final question I, that I have is, what are you taking away from here? Or what will you say to the people once you leave South Sudan? It is serious that uh, the escalation of violence, the crimes committee, including rape, maiming, etc., name it, we can bring it to an end, providing that there is, a, there is a will. And we are ready to support every effort of this government in that regard to bring to an end the escalation of this hatred. Welcome back to the show. In our next story, we highlight some remarks made at a press conference by the advisor on prevention of genocide at the conclusion of his trip to South Sudan. Concluding his five-day trip to South Sudan, the special advisor of the Secretary General on the Prevention of Genocide, Adama Diang, said violations have been ongoing, accountability is not being fulfilled, and there is renewed violence on a daily basis. This, he said, was shattering any hopes of reconciliation. He said his trip came after because he had received worrying reports of an escalating risk of ethnic violence in the country. I am dismayed to report that what I have seen, what I have heard, has confirmed my concerns 
that there is a strong risk of violence escalating along ethnic lines with the potential for genocide. In December of 2013, the country fell into a civil war which pitted tribe against tribe in what seemed to be a politically motivated tribal struggle. Since then, a peace agreement was signed in August 2015 between the two warring parties to end the violence. With the country descending back into violence in the capital of Juba, with the ethnic lines being drawn once again, Diang, who is a legal and human rights expert, called the situation in the country very troubling. During his trip, he held talks with various government officials, the civil society, and the local population. He said those he talked to were very open and frank about the situation and their beliefs. Throughout the week, Conversation with all actors have confirmed that what began as a political conflict has transformed into what could become what could become an outright ethnic war. With the stalling of the implementation of the peace agreement, the current humanitarian crisis, a stagnating economy, and the proliferation of arms all of the ingredients are there for a dangerous escalation of violence. At the press conference, the Under Secretary General said he went to the town of Ye where there is a humanitarian crisis due to ongoing fighting taking place there since crisis hit the country in July. I heard reports of violence that included targeted killings, assault, maiming, mutilation and rape by armed men, some in uniform and others not. There were cases of the barbarous use of machet, which remind me the Rwanda, the hundred days in Rwanda. Adama Diang said the leaders of the two warring sides need to hold their commanders in the field accountable for atrocities their men commit. He stressed the need for an inquiry and said that his office has raised $300,000 towards setting up an African Union court to try offenders. At this stage, it is difficult to determine, to say that this is an ethnic cleansing. No, it is not yet the case. There is no genocide. If not, I would not be here. I'm here to prevent that genocide. I'm here to prevent ethnic cleansing. He said that despite there being no genocide, reports of some communities being flown out of the Ye area and an increase in hate speech by youth, especially on social media, was ongoing. Diang told the journalists present that the leaders of South Sudan must remember that with their sovereignty comes responsibility to the people. On his return to New York, Adama Dieng briefed the Security Council on his trip to South Sudan. Following up is a story we filed for you. Both the United Nations top official in South Sudan, Ellen Margaret Lloyd, and the United Nations Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, Adama Dieng, briefed the United Nations Security Council in New York and expressed their concerns about ongoing unrest and tensions in the country. Ellen Lloyd, told the Security Council that every effort towards peace is crucial and the country must not lose hope for peace. She reiterated on a call for the guns to go silent and said it is necessary to cling to every little sign of hope. The guns simply have to be silenced if the suffering of the people is not going to become even more dire. Lloyd flagged that there was a risk of a full-scale conflict in the country due to many factors. The deterioration of the economy and the increasingly fragmented conflict, often with ethnic undertones that we are seeing, have placed the country on a potential downward slide towards greater diversiveness and risk of full-scale civil conflict that could render national cohesion almost impossible to achieve. Speaking to the Security Council, the Special Advisor of the Secretary General on the Prevention of Genocide, Adama Dieng, who was in the country a week ago, said the signs of ethnic hatred in the country 
needed to be stopped. I saw all the signs that ethnic hatred and targeting of civilians could evolve into genocide if something is not done now to stop it. I urge the Security Council and member states of the region to be united and to take action. Also speaking at the Security Council session, United States Ambassador Samantha Power said South Sudan is a nation at a precipice. South Sudan is a nation at the precipice. As Mr. Dieng said upon completing his visit to the country last week, there is, quote, a strong risk of violence escalating along ethnic lines with the potential for genocide, end quote. When the UN's designated special advisor for the prevention of genocide reaches the conclusion that genocide could be imminent, it should serve as a wake-up call for us all. South Sudan, the world's youngest country, gained independence from Sudan in 2011, but fell into a bitter conflict at the end of 2013. A return to conflict on the eve of the country's fifth anniversary of independence reversed gains made towards a peace agreement signed in August 2015. Welcome back. As usual, we will leave you the Voices of Peace segment. Here is what we got from Adama Dieng. For now, goodbye, and we hope to catch up again next week. Because of the concern I had relating to my mandate, which is preventing genocide, and as you know, I lead also the Office of the Responsibility to Protect, I decided to come to South Sudan and to have a first-hand assessment of the current situation by meeting with the uh, government authorities, the civil societies, and I was also very pleased to have a long discussion with the people who are today in a protection of civilian site, POC, and I was very moved by their testimonies and I did show sympathy to them and the message I deliver to them is a message of peace. We have to do every effort because these people despite the uh, minimum which is provided to them by the international community through the United Nations, their main desire is to return back to their respective places, to return back in a country which is peaceful and to really take care of their children, to take care of their families.